This is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. It is Thursday, January 30th, 2020, and we are live. So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, share this on your social media platform, share this on YouTube. Invite your friends to tune in. So we know Dr. King Day uh, was celebrated January 20th. You saw, many of you all saw the three hour presentation I did uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, dealing with Dr. King and why he was the most hated man in America. Uh, 1968 when he was assassinated and we also talked about guns in the civil rights movement. So uh, January 30th is the anniversary of Dr. King's house being firebombed in Montgomery, Alabama during the Montgomery bus boycott. His house was firebombed January 30th 1956. Okay so we're going to talk some about that history and uh, also talk about um, uh, guns in the civil rights movement and I'm going to, you know, I'm going through reading this book now. Um, this nonviolent stuff that gets you killed, how guns made the civil rights movement possible by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. And he talks about Dr. King here in the uh, book as well. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people don't know is Dr. King, one, owned guns. During the Montgomery bus boycott, he owned guns. And he tried to get a concealed pistol license in 1956 after his house was firebombed. Okay, so we're going to talk some about that as well. And I'm going to share a few articles with you uh, dealing with this history. Now, what's interesting is um, Equal Justice Initiative, EJI.org, which is uh, Brian Stevenson's, Brian Stevenson, Attorney Brian Stevenson's um, organization. You know, they have an article about this, and you see me share um, their post each day dealing with this date in, in, this, this date in history. And then also History.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, they have an article dealing with this history as well. But the article from History.com is different than the one from EJI.org. The one from History.com leaves out some very, very important information. Okay, So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to share a few articles with you, so get your pen and pad handy um, so you can write down this information. And then also African American business owners post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Okay. All right. So um, let me post this here on the thread of the broadcast. So let's look at this article here from um, EJI.org, Equal Justice Initiative. All right. And it's entitled... Uh, let's pin that there. Okay. Uh, let's see here. The one from EJI.org. Uh, where is it? We have it here. All right, just a second here. We may go to the one from um, History.com. Let's bring that up. And then EJI.org. Okay. Okay, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s home bombed in Montgomery, Alabama. This is from EJI.org. This, this took place on January 30th, 1956. This was two days before the lawsuit of Browder versus Gale was filed. The lawsuit of Browder versus Gale uh, was filed by Attorney Fred Gray, and this is what's going to end segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. Okay, this, this um, lawsuit is going to go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And ultimately, this is what ended segregation on the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. So, yes, the Montgomery bus boycott was necessary. And, yes, it did have a big impact. And it put a financial strain on businesses and the um, infrastructure to the government there in Montgomery, Alabama. But the Montgomery bus boycott is not what ended segregation on the buses. Okay, It was the lawsuit of Browder versus Gale and the four plaintiffs in the lawsuit were Aurelia S. Browder, Claudette Colvin, Mary Louise Smith, and Susie McDonald, four African American women who refused to give up their seats on the buses there in Montgomery, Alabama. And that was before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat December 1st, 1955. 
So on the evening of January 30th, 1956, one month after the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, Montgomery bus boycott uh, started Monday morning, December 5th, 1955. The Montgomery, Alabama home of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was bombed while his wife Coretta Scott King, uh, seven-week-old daughter Yolanda, and a neighbor were inside. The front of the home was damaged, but no one was injured. The front of the home was damaged, but no one was injured. I saw Face-to-Face uh, -face Africa has an article about this as well. And you see uh, a picture of, uh, of the front of the house, okay? And you see how it was damaged. Part of the, um, the upper portion of the house, I guess the, um, the awning or something like that, is, is hanging down. So you, you, you see some of the devastation. So Dr. King rushed home to find a large crowd gathered outside of his home. Some of them were carrying weapons and preparing to take action in defense. The crowd cheered Dr. King's arrival and the mayor and police commissioner urged the crowd to remain calm and promised the bombing would be fully investigated. So the mayor at the, at the time was Mayor William A. Gale, G-A-Y-L-E. When we look at the lawsuit of Broder versus Gale, uh, the mayor was one of the defendants, okay? Because um, these African Americans sued the mayor, the police chief, members of the city council. They sued the Montgomery Bus Lines, Inc., which was the, um, the bus company. They sued a number of people in this lawsuit. So uh, the crowd cheered Dr. King's arrival and the mayor and police Commissioner urged the crowd to remain calm and promised the bombing would be fully investigated. Now, Dr. King confirmed his family was safe and then addressed the anxious and angry crowd, many of whom were members of his church. Okay, so uh, he advocated for nonviolence. He said, quote, if you have weapons, he pleaded, take them home. If you do not have them, please do not seek them. We cannot solve uh, this problem through violence. We must meet violence with nonviolence. Now, the crowd dispersed peacefully after Dr. King assured them, go home and don't worry, we are not hurt. And remember, if anything happens to me, there will be others to take my place. Okay, so that is the, uh, the article from EJI.org, Equal Justice Initiative. Okay. What's going to happen after that is Dr. King is going to try to get a concealed pistol license in Montgomery, Alabama. I think it was February of 1956. But he's going to be denied the he's going to be denied the concealed pistol license. Okay, I'll share another article dealing with that, and I'm going to um, share a little bit of the book, uh, this nonviolent stuff that gets you killed: How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible, by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. Okay, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. and um, uh, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. was a field secretary for SNCC Student Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for five years in rural Mississippi organizing African-Americans to register to vote and uh, fighting for a, uh, a Voting Rights Act in 1965. And he talked about how it was, not, oh, now the book is subtitled, I forgot to tell you the subtitle of the book, the book is subtitled, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible. How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible, okay? I want to make sure you all see this. So a lot of what we have been taught about the civil rights movement and being a nonviolent movement is largely historically inaccurate because it was African Americans with guns who protected the civil rights workers. It's going to be African American men with guns who are going to protect Dr. King even before the Deacons for Defense of Justice uh, were founded in uh, 1964, Jonesboro, Louisiana. If we look at the article from History.com, Martin Luther King Jr.'s home is bombed January 30th, 1956. Uh, so it talks about, uh, it says on January 30th, 1956, an unidentified white supremacist terrorist bombed the uh, Montgomery home of Reverend Dr. King. No one was harmed, but the explosion outraged the community and was a major test of King's steadfast commitment to nonviolence. King was relatively new to Montgomery, Alabama, but had quickly inv um, involved himself in the civil rights struggle there. He was a leading organizer of the Montgomery bus boycott, which began in December 1955. After activist Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a segregated city bus to a white passenger. So we know that the Montgomery Improvement Association is going to be formed in early December 1955. I think it was December 5th, 1955, actually. Um, the Montgomery Improvement Association is going to be formed, and this is going to be the organization that's going to guide the Montgomery bus boycott. And that organization elected Dr. King to be the head of the Montgomery Improvement Association and to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. 
So uh, the boycott brought Dr. King national recognition, but also made him a target of white, white supremacists. He was speaking at a nearby church on the evening of January 30th when a man pulled up in a car, walked up to King's house, and tossed an explosive onto the porch, okay, a, a firebomb. The bomb went off, damaging the house, but, not, uh, but did not harm Dr. King's wife, Coretta, who was inside with the couple's seven-month-old daughter, um, uh, Yolanda. News of the bombing spread quickly, and an angry crowd soon gathered outside King's home. A matter of minutes after his home had been bombed, standing feet away from the site of the explosion, King preached nonviolence. He said, he said, quote, I want you to love your enemies. He told his supporters, be good to them, love them, and, and let them know you love them. It's a prime example, so, uh, end quote. It's a prime example of King's deeply held belief in nonviolence as what could have been a riot instead became a powerful display of the highest ideas of the civil rights movement. So King added that, quote, if I am stopped, this movement will not stop, end quote, a sentiment he repeated throughout his life. Later that same year, while the boycott was still in effect, someone fired a shotgun at King's home, and they continued to receive death threats and intimidation, including a threatening letter from the FBI until King's assassination in 1968. Now, we also know later in 56, in September 1956, his house was firebombed again also. On at biography.com's website, they have a video dealing with that when Dr. King's house was firebombed in September of 1956. So bombings, shootings, and arson as African, uh, at African American churches remain shockingly common in the United States. A massacre committed by a white supremacist at a church in Charleston, South Carolina, claimed uh, nine lives in 2015 and 2019. So talking about Dylan Roth, and in and in 2019, the son of a local sheriff's deputy was arrested and charged with a string of arson attacks on African American churches in Louisiana. Now, what's interesting, neither one, um, neither one of these articles talk about Dr. King owning guns. And they didn't talk about uh, Dr. King trying to get a concealed pistol license um, in 1956 as a result of his house being firebombed and the death threats that he's getting. Okay. Uh, so, in the article from EJI.org, Equal Justice Initiative, it, 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 uh, it says the crowd cheered Dr. King's arrival and the mayor and police commissioner urged the crowd to remain calm and promised the bombing would be fully investigated. Okay? Now, even though ostensibly Dr. King is telling them to, if you have weapons, go home, and he's uh, preaching nonviolence ostensibly, at this point, Dr. King still owns guns. One. Two, we know it's going to be African American men around him who own guns and protect him and civil rights workers. And it very well could be that what he said, he said that because the police chief and the um, mayor were there as well to give, to give cover and keep things calm. Because what he didn't want is a riot to break out or rebellion to break out while they have the bus boycott taking place. And, this, and, and they're getting national attention because of this bus boycott. They don't want something like this to derail it. Okay? So let's look at um, a couple of articles here. One is from, let's see, where do we go? Um... Well, well, we'll look at this here. Um, at Stanford.edu, uh, they have a King Institute, Stanford University, on their website. So they have a lot of articles about Dr. King, writings of his, things like this, right? They have an entry here, King's Home Firebomb, January 30th, 1956. Uh, at 9.15 p.m., while King is speaking between uh, before 2,000 congregants at a mass meeting at First Baptist Church, his home is uh, his home is bombed. Uh, Coretta Scott King and their daughter Yolanda Denise are not injured. King addresses a large crowd that gathers outside the house, uh, uh, pleading for nonviolence. The city commission promises police protection for King and offers a $500 reward for the capture and conviction of the persons responsible for the bombing. The King stay at the home of Dexter 
uh, of Dexter Deacon um, uh, J.T. Brooks. Okay, so that's uh, uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, late that night, King Sr., Dr. King's father, his daughter Christine, son A.D., and Coretta's father, uh, Obadiah Scott, uh, arrive hoping to convince Dr. King and his family to return to Atlanta, but he refuses. Because he's committed to um, this bus boycott. All right. Now, if we look at theguardian.com, the, the theguardian.com, there's an article from, uh, what's the date on this? January 20th, 2014, when Martin Luther King gave up his guns, when Martin Luther King gave up his guns. And it says, King became an icon of pacifism, but he also believed in confrontational direct action. And it talks about when he tried to get a concealed pistol license in 1956. Um, few are aware that Martin Luther King Jr. once applied for a permit to carry a concealed handgun. In his 2011 book, Gunfight, UCLA law professor Adam Winkler notes, that after King's house was bombed in 1956, the clergyman applied in Alabama for a concealed carry permit. Local police loathed to grant such permits to African Americans de uh, deemed him quote unquote unsuitable and denied his application. The lesson from this incident is not, as some NRA members have tried to suggest in recent years, that Dr. King should be remembered as a gun toting Republican. Um, and among many other problems, this portrayal neglects, neglects to acknowledge how Republicans use conservative anger about civil rights advances to win over the Dixiecrat South to their side of, uh, of the aisle. Rather, the fact that Dr. King would request license to wear a gun in 1956 just as, just as he was being catapulted onto the national stage illustrates the profundity of the transformation that he underwent over the course of his public career. So if we look at this, and you can read this article in full and it talks about him adopting um, the uh, nonviolent um, ideology of Mahatma Gandhi and also January 30th is the anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi being assassinated but we all know, we all know Gandhi was a racist, right? We all know Gandhi did not like African people at all. The numerous uh, negative statements that Gandhi um, made about African people like when he was in South Africa so we've posted you know AtlantaBlackStar.com has articles about that we've posted a number of articles dealing with this but History.com has an article January 30th this day in history January 30th Gandhi assassinated uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, well Mohandas Gandhi uh, the political and spiritual leader of the Indian independence movement is assassinated in New Delhi by a Hindu extremist okay so you can read that we'll post the we'll post these links here on the thread of the broadcast now let's go back to uh, the one from the Guardian um, let's see here okay so the article uh, from the Guardian goes on uh, when, when Dr. King gave up his guns uh, it goes on to say, okay, so Dr. King, a newcomer to Montgomery, Alabama, was unexpectedly thrust into the leadership of the, mo of the movement, movement uh, chosen in part because he was not identified with any of the established factions among the city's prominent uh, African Americans. So when you watch Eyes on the Prize, and they talk about the Montgomery bus boycott, E.D. E. Nixon is interviewed, who was a past president of the NAACP. He was a local activist there. Coretta Scott King was interviewed. Rosa Parks was interviewed. And they said that Dr. King was chosen because he was so new in Montgomery, Alabama. Very, very few people knew who he was. He wasn't part of certain factions in the community, things like this. So he was picked to lead it. He did not want the job. Okay. He took the job reluctantly because he felt other activists who had a history there should be uh, one of the ones to lead the Montgomery Improvement Association. But So he reluctantly took the job. Okay, so soon Dr. King was receiving phone calls on which unidentified voices warned, quote, listen, N-word, we've taken all we want from you. Before next week, you'll be sorry you even came to Montgomery, end quote. After such threats resulted in the bombing of King's home in February 1956, 
armed watchmen uh, guarded against further assassination attempts. I think they're talking about January 30th, 1956. Okay, so he's going to have armed watchmen guard his home after his house is fireballed. And then also we know in his last book, where do we go from here, Chaos or Community, chapter 2 is called Black Power, okay? So Dr. King, see, we have to read Dr. King's books. We have to read his writings, because every Dr. King day, and if you, if you um, January 20th on Dr. King day, I did a three-hour broadcast. Go back and watch it. It's on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. It's on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. And I go deep into this, right? When they have these Dr. King Day celebrations, they don't deal, they deal with the emasculated Dr. King. They don't deal with the revolutionary Dr. King, okay? Uh, and they, they deal with the Dr. King that largely is designed to make white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African Americans. So if we look at page 27 of where do we go from here, chaos or community. Uh, Dr. King said, uh, I tried to make it clear that besides opposing violence on principle, I could imagine nothing more impractical and disastrous than for any of us, through misguided judgment, to precipitate a violent confrontation in Mississippi. We had neither the resources nor the techniques to win. Furthermore, I asserted many Mississippi whites from the government on down would enjoy nothing more than for us to turn to violence in order to use this in a, to use this as an excuse to wipe out scores of Negroes in and out of the march. Finally, I contended that the debate over the question of self-defense was unnecessary since few people suggested that Negroes should not defend themselves as individuals when attacked. The question, let me repeat this. Finally, I contended that the debate over the question of self-defense was unnecessary since few people suggested that Negroes should not defend themselves as individuals when attacked. The question was not whether one should use his gun when his home was attacked, but whether it was tactically wise to use a gun while participating in an organized demonstration. If they lowered the banner of nonviolence, I said, Mississippi injustice would not be exposed and the moral issues would be obscured, obscured. Um, okay, so check that out. So, you know, we have to read, because uh, we have to read Dr. King's writings, number one. And this was his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, written in 1967, okay? Written in late 1967. So it was written after the, um, it was written after he came out in opposition to the Vietnam War, which is, um, April 4th, 1967, okay? And we know the next day he became the most hated man in America. Banned from the White House by President Johnson. He delivered his speech beyond Vietnam, uh, April 4th, 1967. All right, so let's continue here. Okay, so the response, uh, this res if we go back to the article, why did Dr. King, or when Dr. King gave up his guns, okay, from theguardian.com. This response reflected King's still tentative embrace of the theory and practice of nonviolence. This is in 1956. In his, talks, in, in his talks before mass meetings, King preached the Christian injunction to quote-unquote love thy enemy. Having read Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, in college, he described the bus boycott as an quote, act of massive non-cooperation, end quote, act of massive non-cooperation and regularly called for passive resistance. But King did not use the term nonviolence, and he admitted that he knew little about Gandhi or the Indian independence leader, leader's campaigns. As King biographer Taylor Branch notes, out-of-state visitors who were knowledgeable about the principles of unarmed direct action, such as Reverend Glenn Smiley of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and Bayard Rustin, Bayard Rustin, of the War Resisters League reported that King and other Montgomery activists were, quote, at once gifted and unsophisticated in nonviolence, end quote, at once gifted and unsophisticated in nonviolence, end quote. So it's going to be Bayard Rustin who's going to basically convince Dr. King to get rid of his guns. Because what happened was, so if we look at, 
this nonviolent stuff would get you killed, how guns made the civil rights movement possible. Um, if we look at the back of the book, it says, Visiting Martin Luther King Jr. during the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott, journalist William Worthy, W-O-R-T-H-Y, journalist William Worthy almost sat on a loaded pistol. Just for self-defense, Dr. King assured him. It was not the only weapon King kept for such a purpose. One of his advisors remembered the Reverend's Montgomery, Alabama home as an arsenal, as an arsenal. Like King, many ostensibly nonviolent civil rights activists embraced their constitutional right to self-protection. Yet this crucial dimension of the Afro-American freedom struggle has been long ignored by history. Ostensibly means it gives the uh, superficial uh, image or, the, or, or it, gives, it gives a uh, superficial facade of being one thing, but it's really something else. Okay, so on the surface, it looks nonviolent, but it, it, but it really isn't. Because it was Negroes with guns who were protecting the civil rights, uh, protecting the civil rights workers. So like King, many ostensibly nonviolent civil rights activists embraced their constitutional right to self-protection. Yet this crucial dimension of the Afro-American freedom struggle has been long ignored by history. In the book, This Nonviolent Stuff That Gets You Killed, Charles E. Cobb Jr. Reco uh, recovers this history, describing the vital role that armed self-defense, armed self-defense has played in the survival and liberation of black communities. Drawing on his experiences in the civil rights movement and giving voice to its participants, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. lays bare the paradoxical relationship between the nonviolent civil rights struggle and the long history and importance of African Americans taking up, taking up arms to defend themselves against white supremacist violence. Okay, so if we look at page eight, okay, and how's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast, your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in. We got Michael, we got Eric, Tammy, Anita. How's everybody doing? Okay, so if we look at page eight, um, it says some leaders were committed to nonviolence as a way of life. Borrowing from Mohandas Gandhi's uh, concept of soul force, quote unquote, soul force, S O U L, force, F O R C E, they rejected the idea of harming another person even when their own lives might be at stake in civil rights struggle. Dr. King is perhaps the most prominent of these figures, although he came to this outlook slowly. Another is Reverend James M. Lawson, the mentor of the uh, student movement in Nashville, Tennessee. The Nashville movement was a springboard for a small core of young activists, including former uh, SNCC chairman John Lewis, who's now Congressman Lewis, okay, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who were also firmly and philosophically committed to nonviolence as a way of life and who would find their way into leadership positions in SNCC and SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. For some activists, however, nonviolence was simply a useful tactic. For some, for some, for, for, sorry, for most activists, for most activists, however, nonviolence was simply a useful tactic. One, did that, one that did not preclude self-defense whenever it was considered necessary and possible. Even Dr. King, his commitment to nonviolence as a way of life notwithstanding, acknowledged the legitimacy of self-defense and sometimes blurred the line between nonviolence and self-defense. Let me repeat, even Dr. King, his commitment to nonviolence as a way of life notwithstanding, acknowledged the legitimacy of self-defense and sometimes blurred the line between nonviolence and self-defense. Quote, the first public expression of disenchantment with nonviolence arose around the question of self-defense, end quote, Dr. King wrote. He said, quote, in a sense, this is a false issue for the right to defend one's home 
in one's person when attacked has been guaranteed through the ages by common law. End quote. Ironically, on this point, African Americans and whites in the South tended to be in unexpressed general agreement. It was not uncommon for African American adults to teach young whites how to use a weapon for hunting and incidents of gunplay inside African American communities were frequently ignored by white authority. Although many whites were uncomfortable with the idea of African Americans owning guns, especially in the 1960s, the South's powerful gun culture, the South's powerful gun culture and weak gun control laws enable African Americans to acquire and keep weapons and ammunition with relative ease. So, I first found out about um, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. Roland Martin, Roland Martin interviewed him on uh, News One Now with Roland Martin when it was on TV One. And this was, I think, 2015. Okay, I think it was. Uh, and if you go to Roland's YouTube channel, the interview is still there. And uh, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. is a history professor. And he, he, one of the things he talked about is how in the South you grew up in a gun culture. Okay? So a lot of times you may grow up on a farm. You have to be able to protect your farm. Um, a, lot of those, a lot of those rural areas, they didn't have police. They had sheriffs. Okay? So the sheriff's force was, so a lot of people didn't live in the inner city when they owned farms. They lived out, outside on the outskirts of the city, what have you. They live in rural areas. So you had to be able to protect your farmland. You got to be able to, to protect your farmland for people trying to steal livestock or predators who are trying to, uh, you know, kill your chickens, all different types of things like this. And then also you may go hunting, okay? So you may, you know, learn to hunt when you're a boy, your father gives you a 22 rifle, or you know, something like this. You go hunt squirrels, you hunt rabbits, what have you. You grew up in a gun culture. So that's, that's a different culture than many African Americans who grew up in the North. Now what's going to happen is, during the Great Migration, when African Americans migrate from the South up North, and many of us are fortunate enough to move into houses because, uh, for instance, here in Detroit, because of World War II, um, you have jobs that get desegregated in the Department of Defense. So many African Americans are moving from the South up North, and then we're moving to the Sojourner Truth Homes uh, that were opened up for African American Department of Defense employees. Okay, here in Detroit. And, you know, when I do uh, my presentations that were Black Migration 16, 19, to 2019, and I talk about the uh, Detroit race riot in 1943, which was during World War II. Okay, I show you a picture of an uh, African-American man outside of his home in a Sojourner Truth Projects, Sojourner Truth area. He's outside of his home with a gun. Okay, because we're migrating from the south up north, and we're being met by racism from white people who, because uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these housing projects, uh, many times may be set up in white neighborhoods and you have white people who didn't think we belonged there and we, we brought our guns with us from the south up north and we're using our guns to defend our homes okay so this is a really deep history when they you know when I watch eyes on the prize they don't talk about any of this stuff when I when I see um, a lot of um, the Dr. King Day celebrations that are sponsored by uh, corporations and they have the corporate breakfasts, corporate sponsored breakfasts and corporate lunches, things like that. They don't deal with any of this. Okay, they don't talk about how guns make the civil rights movement possible. If they're in Professor uh, Professor James Small, who's one of my teachers, you see him in the Hidden Colors documentaries. I've interviewed him a number of times. Professor Small has told me personally, he said if he said it would it had not been for black people with guns, there would not have been a civil rights movement. This is the same thing Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. is saying. Okay, so let's go back to this um, article here from uh, The Guardian. Okay, before we get to that, uh, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. 
For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313-645-4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com that's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com you can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com bhistory101 at yahoo.com Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business. Encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts, that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. Okay, so let's continue. All right, let's go back to the article from The Guardian. So, uh, so after Dr. King's house is firebombed January 30th, 1956, we see he's going to be armed uh, African American men who act as watchmen guarding. Uh, his house and protecting him from further assassination attempts. Okay, so this response reflected Dr. King's still tentative embrace of the theory and practice of nonviolence. Uh, okay, let me skip down. Okay, we uh, dealt with that. Okay, Bayard Rustin. Um, okay, so both Bayard Rustin and Reverend Glenn Smiley took notice of the firearms around the King household and argued for their removal. In a famous incident described by historian David Garrow, G-A-R-R-O-W, Bayard Rustin was visiting Dr. King's parsonage, his house, with reporter Bill Worthy, William Worthy. So that's the incident that's talked about uh, in this nonviolent stuff will, make, uh, will get you killed. When the journalist almost sat on a pistol, he and Dr. King stayed up, uh, stayed up late that night arguing whether armed self-defense in the home could end up damaging the movement. It was not long before King had come around to the position advocated by groups like the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Uh, in 1959, at the invitation of the Gandhi National Memorial Fund, King made a pilgrimage to India to study the principles 
of, uh, of Gandhi and he was moved by the experience ultimately he never embraced the complete pacifism okay ultimately he never embraced the complete pacifism later in the black power years King made a distinction between people using guns to defend themselves in the home and the question of quote whether it was tactically wise to use a gun while participating in an organized protest end quote so that's that quote that comes from page 27 of where do we go from here chaos or community um, that's written by Dr. King chapter 2 deals with black power and the black power movement okay so that's what that quote comes from I already shared that with you Dr. King is making this a distinction between the two okay so later in the black power years King made a distinction between people using guns to defend themselves in the home and the question of quote whether it was tactically uh, wise to use a gun while participating in an organized protest end quote but for himself King claimed nonviolence as quote a way of life and he maintained his resolve under conditions that would make others falter okay so uh, okay so you can read the rest of this here uh, but it, at the same time it's going to be men with guns who protect Dr. King and also Dr. King is going to sometimes use the Dickens for defense and justice to protect civil rights workers so on, uh, on the surface face on the surface is ostensibly nonviolent but when you look below the surface no it's it's Negroes with guns it's, it's Negroes with guns protecting the civil rights workers okay you can read the rest of this because it's kind of a long article I don't have time to get through all of this but you get the idea as I, as I explained you know uh, oftentimes there was a reason why most slaves ran away at nighttime and not in the daytime you know we didn't have PhDs but we weren't dumb we knew we had a better chance of succeeding and getting away if we ran away in the cover of night alright so uh, let's go back to let's see let's go back to this nonviolent stuff to get you killed page 8 for most activists however nonviolence was simply a useful tactic one that did not preclude self-defense whenever it was considered necessary and possible even Dr. King his commitment to nonviolence as a way of life not notwithstanding acknowledged the, le the legitimacy of self-defense and sometimes blurred the line between nonviolence and self-defense sometimes blurred the line between nonviolence and self-defense quote the first public expression of disenfranchisement with nonviolence arose around the question of self-defense he wrote in a sense this is a false issue for for the right to defend one's home and one's person when attack has been guaranteed through the ages by common law ironically on this point African Americans African Americans and whites in the South tended to be in unexpressed general agreement general agreement it was not uncommon for black adults to teach young whites how to use a weapon for hunting and in incidents of gunplay inside blacks black communities were frequently uh, frequently ignored by white authority okay so next uh, paragraph because guns are so so common a part of southern culture there was far less controversy about their use in the nonviolent freedom movement than one might imagine okay because once again you know before the great migration of 1915 to 1970 90 percent of African Americans lived in the south so we're growing up in southern culture in a gun culture indeed the characterizations that have so often pigeonholed movement activists and and activity the, the terms militant nonviolent radical left-wing moderate really only apply to a very thin layer of leadership ordinary people the local folk who made up the force that really shaped southern civil rights struggle did not use such labels for themselves did not use such labels for themselves they saw themselves and spoke of themselves as being in the movement quote unquote in the movement the characterizations so convenient to the media and to scholarship were not part of the natural language of their community even when these expressions seeped into the seeped into their speech 
in one widely circulated movement story usually repeated with laughter and almost certainly apocryphal an older woman active in the movement in Mississippi or Louisiana or Alabama or Georgia or somewhere in the south depending, depending upon who is telling the story responds to radio television or newspaper denunciation of some movement activity as a communist plot by saying to a movement worker quote I'm sure glad you communists came in here end quote labels aside it was what people encountered in everyday life that had the greatest impact on their thinking and southern black people had a powerful incentive to arm themselves because the federal government was unwilling to protect southern freedom fighters local law enforcement officers many of them many of them also members of the Ku Klux Klan ignored their duty and frequently joined in terrorist acts themselves people in uh, people in the african-american communities were willing to do what was necessary to protect fellow blacks who were risking their lives by speaking out against and actively challenging the status quo the willingness of some to take armed defensive action enabled the civil rights movement to sustain itself during the mid 20th century Despite its importance to the Southern Freedom Movement, the relationship between nonviolence and armed self-defense has been consistently overlooked and misunderstood. Let me repeat this. Despite its importance to the Southern Freedom Movement, the relationship between nonviolence and armed self-defense has been consistently overlooked and misunderstood. The dichotomy between violence and nonviolence so often imposed by historians and other analysts is not very helpful for understanding either the use of guns in local black communities or contemporaneous movement discussion and debate about self-defense. The use of guns for self-defense was not the opposite of nonviolence. The use of guns for self-defense was not the opposite of nonviolence as is commonly thought something more complicated but absolutely normal was at play. Hart, Hartman Turnbow, T-U-R-N-B-O-W, precisely illustrates what when explaining why without hesitation he used his rifle to drive away night riders attacking his home. He said, quote, I had a wife and I had a daughter and I love my wife just like the white man loves his, just like the white man loves his and a white man will die for his and I shall die for mine, end quote. That's page 10, okay? This nonviolent stuff will get you killed, how guns made the civil rights movement possible by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. Right now, and this book came out in, I think it was 2015 or 2014. Let me see here. 2014, all right, now. If we look at, I think, two more articles here, or three, um, the, uh, three from the Washington Post. Then also, uh, if you all like this type of information, uh, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, uh, or dollar sign. Uh, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show through uh, PayPal. It helps support the African History Network, helps us keep doing the research, finance our Sunday night show, etc. Um, July 28, 2014, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. wrote an article for the Washington Post entitled This Nonviolent Stuff That Gets You Killed. Okay? And I'll, I'll post the link here uh, to this article. See, so what's, what's interesting is I go to a lot of, um, I've been to some Dr. King Day celebrations over the past few years. I don't get asked to speak at a lot of them. I've been to, doc, I've been to African American History Month celebrations. And oftentimes this part of the civil rights movement is not talked about. Now, when we study the Deacons for Defense and Justice, founded July 10, 1964, in Jonesboro, Louisiana, 
we see that the deacons for defense and justice were largely formed to protect the civil rights workers because the local police and the sheriffs were not doing their jobs. Okay, and if we see that when we see the movie, uh, it was on Showtime uh, about the deacons for defense and justice uh, and the star Forrest, Forrest Whitaker. Okay, we see this portrayed in the movie. Face to Face Africa .com has a really good article. Uh, also dealing with the Deacons for Defense and Justice. We posted that article here on our fan page recently. But when we look at um, if we look at this article from Washington Post from Professor Cobb Jr. also July 28, 19, uh, July 20, 2014 he says, one of the most important lessons I learned as a participant in the Southern Freedom Movement of the 1960s shocks many of my liberal friends. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. I am neither a member nor supporter of the NRA, but both sides in today's convoluted arguments about gun control and the Second Amendment need to, uh, need to pay attention to this lesson. To begin, here's an excerpt. From the introduction of my latest book, This Nonviolent Stuff That Get You Killed, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible. Armed self-defense, or to use a term preferred by some, armed resistance. Armed resistance. And I've seen books refer to this as armed resistance. Now these weren't vigilantes. They weren't they weren't out trying to, you know, start a start a race war or something like that. Okay? They were trying to defend their their families, defend their homes, defend their communities, and defend the, um, the civil rights workers. And oftentimes because the police and the sheriffs were not doing their jobs also. Okay, let's just, let's just be clear on that. Uh, and I'm trying to see where is this, what page is this on in the, in the book because it doesn't say. So if you have this book at home, I mean, how many of y'all have read this book? Because a lot of people don't even know about this book. Okay, I'm trying to see where it is in here. But armed self-resistance, or to use uh, a term preferred, uh, to, I'm sorry, armed self-defense, or to use a term preferred by some armed resistance, as part of black struggle began not in the 1960s with angry militant and radical young Afro-Americans, but in the earliest years of the United States as one of African people's responses to oppression. This tradition which culminates with the civil rights struggles and achievements of the mid-1960s cannot be understood independently or outside its broader historical context. In every decade of the nation's history, brave and determined black men and women picked up guns to defend themselves and their communities. Thus the, thus, the tradition of armed self-defense in Afro-American history cannot be disconnected from the successes of what today is called the nonviolent civil rights movement. The tradition of armed self-defense in Afro-American history cannot be disconnected from the, from the successes of what today is called the nonviolent civil rights movement. He's saying they go hand in hand. Okay, participants in that movement always saw themselves as part of a centuries long history of black life and struggle. Guns in no way contradicted the lessons of that history. Guns in no way contradicted the lessons of that history. Indeed, the, his, the, the idea of nonviolent struggle was never what well, sorry indeed the idea of nonviolent struggle was newer in the black community the idea of nonviolent struggle was newer in the black community and it was protected in many ways by gunfire and the threat of gunfire simply put because nonviolence worked so well as a tactic by effecting change and was demonstrably improving their lives some African Americans chose to use weapons to defend the nonviolent freedom movement. Once again, if it had not been for Negroes with guns, there would not have been a civil rights movement. 
Although it is counterintuitive, any discussion of guns in the movement must therefore also include substantial discussion of nonviolence and vice versa. The Southern Freedom Movement of the 1960s was, of the 1960s was broad in its objectives and its strategies, which helps explain the seemingly paradoxical coexistence of guns and nonviolence within it. As noted in 1964 by Robert Bob Moses, Robert P. Bob Moses, director of the Mississippi Project of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNP. He said, quote, it's not contradictory for a farmer to say he's nonviolent and also pledge to shoot a marauder's head off, end quote. A story that former SNCC chairman Stokely Carmichael, who became Kwame Ture, liked to tell was of bringing an elderly woman to vote in Lowndes County, Alabama. So we know it was in 1965 that Stokely Carmichael um, and others, they're going to found the Lowndes County Freedom Organization in, in Lowndes County, Alabama, 1965. And this is helping African Americans register to vote. And their symbol is going to be the Black Panther. This symbol is going to be a Black Panther. And we know it's going to be um, Bobby Seale and Stokely Carmichael, I'm sorry, Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton, who are going to get permission from the Lowndes County Freedom Organization to use the Black Panther as a symbol for the organization that they're forming called the Black Panther Party for Self Defense. There's an uh, article from uh, the root.com that breaks down uh, this history and it deals with Selma. I think that's uh, five things you should know about Selma. Five things you should know about Selma. Okay, so this came out around the time the movie Selma came out. This is from March 6, 2015. Okay, uh, and then incidentally, the character Black Panther from Marvel Comics. That came out before the Black Panther Party for Self Defense came out. Uh, that uh, the, the Black Panther character um, it debuted July 1966 in issue number 52 of the Fantastic Four comic book. Okay, that's July 1966. The Black Panther Party for Self Defense wasn't founded until October 1966. So, if we look here um, at the root, let's see here. Um, number five, the Selma movement helped give birth to the Black Panther Party. At the at the end of the uh, of the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, 23-year-old SNCC activist Stokely Carmichael decided to head to Lowndes County, Alabama, where 80% of the population was African American, but where they were zero, but there were zero black people registered. Uh, to vote. He went there to build a new political party. He formed the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which used the Black Panther as a symbol, okay, as its symbol. In October 1966, Stokely Carmichael, who was now head of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and a leading voice of the Black Power Movement, was a keynote speaker at a conference in Berkeley, California, and the attendants were Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, who would adopt the Black Panther logo, of the uh, LCFO, Lowndes County Freedom Organization, for a new organization they were forming in Oakland, California. This organization was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. But they got, uh, I've read um, other information, they got permission to use the Black Panther as their symbol. Okay, so read this article here, five things you should know about Selma. And this deals with the Selma to Montgomery March. We know Montgomery is the uh, capital of Alabama. All right, let's see. Okay, so we got George, Maurice. Uh, how's everybody doing? Okay, so let's continue here. All right, this was the one from um, Washington Post. Okay, so it's talking about Stokely Carmichael, a story that uh, former 
uh, SNCC Chairman Stoker Carmichael liked to tell was of bringing an elderly woman to vote in Lyons County, Alabama. Okay, so the 1955-56 Montgomery bus boycott. Oh, sorry, I skipped over something. Uh, okay, bringing an elderly woman to vote in Lyons County, uh, Alabama. Quote: She had to be 80 years old and going to vote for the first time in her life. That old lady came up to us, went into her bag, and produced this enormous rusty Civil War look. <laughs> This enormous, rusty, Civil War-looking old pistol. Best, best you hold this for me, son. I'm going to cast my vote now, end quote. Okay. So this is, old, this is an old black woman, about 80 years old, going to vote for the first time. She took a gun. She took a gun with her. Okay. So um, maybe this is where Medea got it from. I don't know. So... The 1955-1956 bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. The student sit-in movement uh, that began in, in 1960 and the freedom rides in 1961 are persuasively demonstrated, all persuasively demonstrated, that nonviolent resistance was an effective way of fighting for civil rights. These were not acts of hate or brutality towards white people who were themselves ignorant of their imprisonment by a system that led them to believe in white supremacy. They were instead aggressive confrontations that challenged the system and recognizing this refutes the notion that nonviolence was a passive tactic. Nevertheless, it was startling to see the willingness of Southern civil rights activists to put themselves in harm's way and their refusal to respond with violence when assaulted. Almost immediately, nonviolent resistance was criticized as dangerous, as dangerous foolishness that reflected weakness, even cowardly submission. Writing in 1957 about the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, Dr. W. B. Du Bois expressed great skepticism about nonviolence. He said, "He said, quote, no normal human being of trained intelligence is going to fight the man who will not fight back." but suppose they are wild beasts or wild men. To yield to the rush of the tiger is death, nothing less." End quote. Six years later, Malcolm X, then a leader of the Nation of Islam, showed greater hostility and less restraint than Dubois. He denounced Martin Luther King Jr. as a modern Uncle Tom, subsidized by whites, quote, to teach the Negroes to be defenseless, end quote. So we know that toward the end of both of their lives, their ideologies were converging. Um, we know that, uh, so if you read uh, Martin Malcolm in America, a dream, a dream or a Nightmare by James H. Cone, he painstakingly deals with this, okay? Uh, we also know that Malcolm's going to join the Civil Rights Movement when he officially separates from the Nation of Islam on March 8, uh, 1964. And um, also, while Malcolm was still in the Nation of Islam, uh, July 31st, 1963, the month before the March on Washington, Malcolm calls for a unification of the civil rights leaders. He sends a letter to the leading civil rights leaders, including Dr. King, and he requests a meeting with them. And he said, we have to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. If you read the article from the Washington Post that deals with, uh, it's uh, entitled, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X Met Just Once. Um, and it deals with that history, but when uh, Malcolm meets Dr. King, March 26, 1964, at the U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights Act of, 19, of uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Malcolm tells Dr. King, "I'm throwing all of my effort into the heart of the Civil Rights Movement," because Malcolm is already separated from the Nation of Islam. Then, so their reactions suggest that neither Dubois or Malcolm X could grasp the fact that nonviolence, although risky, as any challenge to oppression always is, was not passive. That it provided an effective means of directly challenging white supremacy with more than rhetoric. Acts of nonviolence, uh, acts of nonviolent resistance contributed might, uh, might, mightily to ending the mental paralysis that had long kept many black people trapped in fear and subservient to white supremacy, reluctant to even try to take control over their own lives despite the fact that slavery had ended roughly a century early. The principled militant dignity of nonviolent resistance also won nationwide sympathy 
for the idea of extending civil rights to black people. So let's see here. Um, okay, you can read the rest of that article. We'll post a link here. Uh, there's another one that's a really important one I want to get to before we get out of here. So this is um, this article was from by uh, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. This is not about stuff that gets you killed. Okay, you can read, yeah, you can read the rest of that. Let's look at um, Professor Nicholas Johnson. Professor Nicholas Johnson uh, wrote the book Negroes and the Gun, the Black, Tra the Black Tradition of Arms. Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms. Um, he wrote two articles for the Washington Post. The first one uh, was January 3rd, well the first one I look at, January 31st, 2014. Negroes and the Gun, Nonviolent Winchesters and the Fine Art of Concealed Carry in the Modern Civil Rights Movement. Um, and in the article, let's see, he says the longest chapter in the book Negroes and the Gun is devoted to the modern civil rights movement. The record here is rich with oral histories, memories, and other detailed first-hand accounts that illuminated the black tradition of arms. Because once again, growing up in the Southern culture, growing up in the gun culture. Local lore in Columbia, Tennessee, says that in 1946, armed Negroes were a break on plans, B-R-A-K-E, a stop, a break on plans to lynch Thurgood Marshall. The prodigiously armed T.R.M. Howard, his initials T.R.M., T.R.M. Howard, and the surrounding black community were central in the quest for justice for Emmett Till. In 1956, Constant, Constance Baker Motley, who was an African-American female attorney, and she goes on to become the first African-American female federal judge. Constance Baker Motley and Thurgood Marshall in 1956 were guarded by armed black men overnight and on the way to the courthouse when they were in Birmingham, Alabama to press desegregation cases. Rosa Parks recounts vividly a table filled with guns as she and her husband Raymond Parks started hosting activist meetings at their house on Huffman Street, that's there in Montgomery, Alabama. And Raymond, and Raymond Parks' gun was a comfort when harassment began. So um, when they are organizing, when they're having these organizing meetings there in Montgomery, Alabama, and um, Dr. Greg Carr talked about this, I saw him talk about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered, but Rosa Parks said when they would sit down at the table, they would take their guns out and put them, their pistols, take their pistols out, put them on the table. So if the Klan or white supremacists bust in their house while they're meeting, their guns will already be out and they can shoot them. Now this is Rosa Parks. We, we, so when they talk about Rosa Parks, they don't talk about Rosa Parks and guns. I wonder why. Legendary activist Fred Shuttlesworth rode to the rescue with a 15-car caravan of armed black men when freedom, when freedom riders were menaced by a crowd in Aniston. So Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth is the reverend who calls Dr. King in 1963 and asks Dr. King to come to Montgomery, Alabama to uh, participate in the um, Birmingham campaign. Okay, So the Birmingham campaign was the campaign in Birmingham, Alabama to break the back of segregation. In Birmingham, Alabama, all right, and th that campaign was already uh, underway. Dr. King and the movement had suffered a defeat in Albany, Georgia, 1961-1962, called the Albany Movement. And the Albany Movement, um, they were not able to defeat segregation. And Dr. King is looking for victory. 
If you watch Eyes on the Prize, they really break this down. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth calls Dr. King and says, if you come to Alabama, but if you come to Birmingham, Alabama, and help us um, in this movement, I can guarantee you a victory. Okay? So this is, this is what happens. But we're, oftentimes we're not told about these leaders also owning guns, like Mega Evers own guns. See, oftentimes we're not, we, 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 we're shown them marching, but we're also not told that they own guns. Okay, so legendary activist Fred Shuttlesworth rode to the rescue with a 15-car caravan of armed black men when freedom riders were menaced by a crowd in Anniston. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, good friend, Reverend, Ed, uh, Reverend Ed Gardner, would later capture the, the dichotomy that undergirded the movement in a quip about his nonviolent Winchester. His nondiolent Winchester. Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State, was just a child at the time, but vividly reconstructs the scene of her father and the men of Dynamite Hill in Birmingham, Alabama, organizing an armed watch to deter bomb throwers. Dynamite Hill. Now, Birmingham, Alabama was also called Bombingham because white people were bombing so many African Americans' homes. Now, Daisy Bates, who was central to the Little Rock Nine in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, um, desegregating uh, uh, Central High School, okay, because uh, the high school students, they would go to Daisy Bates' house every morning for breakfast. And she would check their homework and she would get them ready to go to school and deal with the racism they were going to deal with. Daisy Bates, Daisy Bates who shepherd, shepherd the Little Rock Nine through the integration struggle, offers a rich record of the culture of arms. Correspondence with Thurgood Marshall confirms that Daisy Bates kept old Betsy at the ready. Her memoir shows that she often carried a gun at once actually she often carried a gun and once actually fired on a seething little man who had launched a firebomb at her at her home our eye is drawn to the famous names but we are lucky that the surviving record is rich with unheralded characters some of these people deserve monuments but we bravely but we barely know them over time one hopes their names will rise in our culture and people will recognize the images and appreciate the, the steel in the eyes of women like Winston Hudson, Leola Blackman, Aura Bryant, O-R-A, Jackie Hicks, Fannie Lou Hamer, and the even uh, deeper lineup of the sober, mature black men who embraced armed self-defense as a crucial private resource. People like Robert F. Williams and the Black Guard, who was the president of the Monroe, uh, North Carolina chapter of the NAACP, okay, who advocated African Americans to, to defend themselves, to, to arm themselves, to protect themselves. So these people not only own guns and fired them in self defense, they also carry guns in defiance of discretionary. Uh, permitting schemes of the type that said a bombing at Martin Luther King's home did not constitute good cause for granting him a permit to carry a gun. That's dealing with February 1956. There are hints in the culture that carrying concealed weapons in defiance of state authority was a minor art form. The Delta activist T.R.M. Howard had a secret compartment built into his car. Fannie Lou Hamer's mother carried a gun concealed in a bucket. Megger Evers hid his pistol in a driver's seat pillow. Others capitalized on the practice of church folk to carry around their Bibles in big leather covers and stuff guns in with the jumble of pens and papers. See, this is, see, they don't talk about this stuff on Eyes on the Prize. Okay? 
we just think that they, they just had Bibles and, you know, and singing gospel songs. And they, they just show us Fannie Lou Hamer singing gospel songs. They don't talk about Fannie Lou Hamer owning guns. But the prize for minimalist creativity goes to the lyrically named Sweets Turnbow. Sweets Turnbow, whose husband Hartman's statement about nonviolence. I mentioned in my first post. At the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, Sweets Turnbow strolled the venues casually carrying a brown paper bag. It looked like she was toting her lunch. Years later, those who knew the truth would tell that inside the paper was a loaded pistol and how, quote, Sweets never went any place without her brown paper bag and gun, end quote. It turns out this was a variation on the method employed by her husband Hartman about whom Julian Bond reported the civil rights activist Julian Bond reported quote it's funny to see a man dressed like a farmer with a briefcase and he opens the briefcase and nothing's in it but an army automatic end quote the narrative of nonviolence is also in the background here and it is proper to acknowledge the unalloyed pacifism of people in the movement like Bob Moses and John Lewis they had strong influence on the dominant narrative that theme is demonstrated in the warning of a white minister from New Jersey that quote the movement is no place for guns end quote after spying a big pistol on the car seat of one of the deacons for defense who Martin Luther King had agreed would provide security for continuation of the March Against Fear. So the March Against Fear was June 1966 in Mississippi. And James Meredith is going to lead the march. He gets shot, he's injured, he can't continue. So other civil rights activists like Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael are going to come and they're going to uh, continue this march. And uh, Dr. King is going to be arrested. Stokely Carmichael is going to be arrested also. And then uh, uh, June 28, 1966, if I remember correctly, June 28, 1966, um, uh, Stokely Carmichael comes out of jail. And, and this is when he's going to use the term black power. OK, and this is like the, the basically the first time he publicly uses the term black power and talk about the, what we want is black power. If you watch the uh, six part series on PBS called African Americans Many Rivers to Cross by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. African Americans Many Rivers to Cross. Um, they talk about this. And the, you can watch it on YouTube. Maybe you can still find it on YouTube. Don't tell them I told you it's on YouTube. Um, but you can you can order you can order it from PBS. Then also, Gates put out a book that's a companion to it. So the book is, is good. Now, they don't talk about the African presence in this country going back 51,700 years ago. you got to read The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep for that. you got to read this book. This is, they're not dealing with the fact that this was our land stolen from us. you got to read The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence for that. Okay, But there's still some good information in this book. Then also... This is the probably the preeminent book on the Deacons for Defense and Justice by Lance Hill. The Deacons for Defense, Armed Resistance, and the Civil Rights Movement. The Deacons for Defense, Armed Resistance, and the Civil Rights Movement. Okay? It, if it had not been for Negroes with guns, there would not have been a civil rights movement. So, uh, they talk about, let's see, the March Against Fear in here. And um, March Against Fear, page 232 to 234. Um, yeah, so you can check that out, okay? But you, we're going to uh, see uh, Kwame Ture uh, talk about black power. Okay, and this is what we want. And that's going to be June of uh, 1966.
All right. Okay, so let's go back to this article here quickly. This is from um, Washington Post. Negroes and the gun, nonviolent Winchesters, and the fine art of concealed carry in the modern civil rights movement. So after spying a big pistol on the car seat of one of the deacons for defense, who Martin Luther King Jr. had agreed would provide, provide security for continuation of the march against fear. But other northern activists, also among the uns unsung, reflected the sentiments, reflected the sentiments of their host about the importance of private self private self-defense. Yale Law student Don Cates, K-A-T-E-S, drew enduring um, drew enduring practical lessons about the value of private firearms from his black host and translated that into a lifetime of gigantically influential Second Amendment scholarship. Native American activist John Salter, S-A-L-T-E-R, explains that his preparations track those of the community, recounting, quote, like a martyred friend of mine, Megar Evers, I traveled armed with a 38 and a 4440 Winchester carbine, end quote. Now, Megar Evers' brother, Charles Evers, also considered the gun an indispensable tool. We are left wondering how to value statements of John Salter and Charles Evers that guns saved their lives against the bloody fact that a man with a gun took the life of their beloved brother and friend, Megar Evers. So that was Byron Della Beckwith, uh, June, I think it was June 12, 1963, that Megar Evers was assassinated, shortly after midnight. One lesson is that a gun is no guarantee of safety, and some will argue that it makes things worse. Still, Megar Evers, John Salter, and countless others chose the gun, suggesting that amid conflicting empirical claims about the costs and benefits of firearms, much of this, un uh, much of this ultimately comes down to private assessments and private choice. Okay, so you can read the rest of it. Uh, this is a really good article here from Professor Nicholas Johnson. Okay, Negroes and the Gun, Nonviolent Winchesters, and the Fine Art of Concealed Carry in the Modern Civil Rights Movement. Once again, all, all this history is just totally left out of the civil rights movement when certain people tell it. All right, now if we look at this last article here, another one from uh, Professor Nicholas Johnson, the, 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 the earlier one he wrote, for the Washington Post, January 27, 2014, The What and Why of Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms. The What and Why of Negroes and the Gun, the Black Tradition of Arms. Okay, let me pull this one up here. Where do we have this? And I have this one pulled up as well. Let's pull this one up. Just a second here. Okay. And once again, he's the author of the book Negroes and the Gun of the Black Tradition of Arms. Okay, African American business owners post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. And uh, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a special promotion going on to uh, help you promote your business. For 25 years, the Black History One-on-One -on -one Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events making it the most traversed black history mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One-on-One -on -one Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop, and race relations.
Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313-645-4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com that's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com you can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com bhistory101 at yahoo.com products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's look at this last article here. Uh, once again, this is, this is another one from Professor Nicholas Johnson. And in this one... Uh, one of the things he says is the black tradition of arms has been submerged because it seems hard to reconcile with the dominant narrative of nonviolence in the modern civil rights movement. But the superficial tension is resolved by the long-standing distinction that was vividly evoked by movement stalwart Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer's approach to segregation is who dominated Mississippi politics was. She said, quote, baby, you just got to love them. Hating just makes you sick and weak, end quote. But asked how she survived the threats from midnight terrorists. Fannie Lou Hamer responded, quote, I'll tell you why. I keep a shotgun in every corner of my bedroom. And the first white man even looked like he wants to throw some dynamite on my porch won't write his mama again, end quote. Now, this is Fannie Lou Hamer. Now, they show us uh, images of Fannie Lou Hamer singing gospel songs. They show us Fannie Lou Hamer, 19, I think it was 1964, Democratic National Convention. They quote Fannie Lou Hamer saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. But they don't share that quote with us about Fannie Lou Hamer. And, and largely... Most African Americans don't know Fannie Lou Hamer own guns and own multiple guns. Like Hartman Turnbull, Fannie Lou Hamer embraced private self defense and political nonviolence without any sense of contradiction. In this, she channeled a more than century old practice and philosophy that evolved through every generation, sharpened by icons like Ida B. Wells, Dr. W. B. Du Bois, and Daisy Bates pressed by the burgeoning NAACP and crystallized by Martin Luther King Jr., who articulated it this way, violence exercised merely in self-defense. All societies from the most primitive to the most cultured and civilized accept as moral and legal the principle of self-defense. Even involving weapons and bloodshed has never been condemned by even Gandhi. When the, Negroes, when the Negro uses force in self-defense, he does not forfeit support. He may even win it by the courage and self-respect it reflects. But violence as a tool of advancement, violence as a tool of advancement involving organization as in warfare, 
possesses incalculable perils. So the article goes on to say, in practice and in policy from the leadership to the grassroots, this view prevailed into the 1960s, right up to the point where the civil rights movement boiled over into violent protests and black radicals openly defied the traditional boundary against political violence. That violent and radical, uh, that violent and radical turn was the catalyst for a dramatic tra transition as the movement ushered in a new black political class. Rising within a progressive political coalition that included the newly minted national gun control movement, the burgeoning black political class embraced gun bans and lesser supply controls as one answer to violent crime in the new domains. By the mid-1970s, these influxes had supplanted the generation's old black tradition of arms with a modern orthodoxy of stringent gun control. The first seven chapters of the book chronicle the rise and evolution of black tradition of arms. Chapter 8 details the pivot from that tradition into the modern orthodoxy of stringent gun control. Okay, so you can read the rest of this article here. Um, this is also from the Washington Post. All right, so once again, you know, uh, January 30th, 1956 is the anniversary of Dr. King's house being firebombed. And, you know, this gets into a history uh, of the civil rights movement that a lot of people don't know about. And this deals with how uh, guns made the civil rights movement possible. And uh, many people don't know uh, Dr. King owned guns or why he got rid of his guns or what he... Um, he said about self-defense in 67, things like this, right? So this is why this history is important. This is why we have to study Dr. King because uh, his image has been totally distorted. We have to study Malcolm X as well. And, you know, February 24, 1966, Dr. King uh, meets with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. This is almost a year to the date that, Dr. that Malcolm was assassinated. He was assassinated February 21st, um, 1965. So, what Malcolm was calling for while he was still in the Nation of Islam was a unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers, not just the civil rights leaders, but also their followers, which is extremely important because when we study Dr. King and Malcolm X and we study how their ideologies are converging toward the end of both of their, their, their lives and their ideologies are steadily evolving, okay? And if you go watch the three-hour presentation I did January 20th, 2020, it deals with uh, Dr. King's distorted legacy, why he's the most hated man in America. I share a interview that NBC News did with him uh, May 8th, 1967. And it's dealing with uh, Beyond Civil Rights Black Power. And from 66 to 68, Dr. King transitions from civil rights to human rights, which is the logical evolution. All right, so we, we really have to understand this because uh, both Dr. King and Malcolm X are misunderstood. The civil rights movement is misunderstood uh, as far as that goes. Okay, uh, be sure to listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. on the Superstation WFDF. And then we broadcast here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Uh, for African American History Month, we have a 15 DVD bundle pack. A lot of my lectures, and actually, I have the additional one, so it's 16. So, I'll sell $100 regularly, like something like $250, something like that. Uh, but this is a Black History Month uh, bundle pack, it's right on the home page of our website. So, you can order that. We have those shipping out quickly, and uh, it includes uh, these are all some lectures I've done the past uh, two or three years. But this will keep you busy for African American History Month. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, we can make that happen, all right? So follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, also on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right, so look, we have to get out of here, and also if you want to support The African History Network, you can donate dollar sign, The AHN Show, uh, through uh, Cash App. Because we have Cash App now, people are asking us to get Cash App. 
dollar sign the AHN show, uh, the AHN show through Cash App, and then also uh, through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button, and through PayPal, if you want to set up for recurring donation, you can do that. Do that. If you want to donate 25, 50, 100, whatever it is, that helps. Let's keep doing the research, pay the bills, stay on the air, and finance our Sunday night show as well. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right now, let's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business encourage patronize and uplift one another blackbusinesstea.com currently has products sold in detroit atlanta chicago and los angeles with proceeds returned to the black community they have a wide selection of hoodies t-shirts mugs hats sweatshirts that support black owned businesses Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one of a kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kathy Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com and you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at 